I'm Jono Buchanan. Now, as we know, and as we've explored over 120 odd videos on this channel now, Logic's an unbelievably powerful program. It contains synths and effects and all kinds of stuff. You don't need me to list what it involves because you've watched 120 episodes with me. And that's great. But you know what? There's other stuff that goes on in recording studios. And sometimes what we want to do is to bring some external sound sources into our projects. Now, of course, sometimes that's going to be plugging in microphones and making live recordings. And sometimes it's going to be working with instruments like the ones behind me. How do we work with external synthesizers when we're working with Logic? And what we're going to do in this episode is to see how we can plug in external synths, what we need to do in order to make them part of the world in which we're existing, and then what we might have to do in order to have their sounds become permanently part of our projects. So what I'm going to do is to press go on this project that at the moment only contains sounds that are coming from inside Logic. So we've got a beat loop, we've got a programmed bass line, and this dusty piano pattern, which is a pattern sequence which is playing a sample based instrument. And it sounds like this. Okay, so there is our project as it stands right now. Now, what I want to do is to get a sound from a synthesizer that's sitting in front of me right here into this project. So what I need to do is a number of things in order to make that possible. So let's just start with some connections before we get any further. And let's really make this basic. Obviously, if I need this keyboard to work and to become part of the environment in which I need uh, this uh, sound to get into my project, firstly, what I need to do is to be able to play it over MIDI. Now, once upon a time, that meant uh, having a dedicated MIDI interface, but most modern synthesizers now have USB connections, which allow us to make a direct MIDI connection if we want to. So what I've got with this synthesizer right here is a USB cable, which is, being, uh, which is connected to the back of my computer, which immediately means that over MIDI, I can play notes from here, and firstly, I can use it as a controller keyboard for all of the sounds within Logic, but it also means that there is a MIDI relationship between my computer and this instrument. And that has a, 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 a chance to be a two-way relationship. In other words, if I set up Logic correctly, messages from Logic can reach this synthesizer to generate sound. Okay, so from a MIDI perspective, I've got a relationship between this keyboard and my computer. But I also need an audio relationship. The sounds within this keyboard obviously need to get out into the real world. I need to be able to hear them, in other words, and potentially record them as well. So what I've also got from my keyboard is the left and right stereo outputs connected to the stereo inputs of my audio interface. The left output is connected to input number one, and the right output is connected to input number two. So whilst I have two separate inputs, they are both being used by the outputs from my keyboard. So I've got the potential for the audio relationship of the sounds within this keyboard to be accessible to my logic system as well. But how do I actually set them up? Well, like this. So what I'm going to do is to create a new track up here and I'm going to need a MIDI track, which is within this box here. Now, normally what happens is that we're dealing with software instruments. In other words, what we want to do is to play Logic's suite of internal sounds. But you can see that underneath that, I have this external MIDI option. Now, what this allows me to do is to start working with external MIDI keyboards. And what I'm going to do is to make sure that this box is checked here, which allows me to work with what's referred to as the external instrument plugin. Now, that's literally a little kind of IO input output plugin, which allows me to configure both the MIDI and the audio relationship between Logic and any instrument that I might want to work with. So I'm going to make sure that that's ticked because I might need to check my settings once I've got this channel set up. But I can actually do a lot within this window here too. So firstly, what I can do is to choose the MIDI destination for where I want messages to go. Now, this instrument is the ASM Hydrosynth Explorer, and because 
It's connected over USB. I can see it directly. But all of the things that can communicate or receive or work with MIDI are listed. Everything that's on my system that is potentially MIDIable, I've just made up another word on this channel, exists within this list. So if what I wanted to do was to interact externally from a MIDI perspective, for example, with my Touche pedal, um, I always call it a pedal and it's not a pedal. But nevertheless, if I wanted to work with it, there you go, I can do that too, I can select it. But I'm interested in working with the Hydrosynth Explorer and just to make life really easy for myself, I'm going to make sure that all MIDI channels are selected in terms of um, communication. It's almost like omni mode. It basically means that any MIDI assignment that I send to it will be received because it's operating on all MIDI channels. Okay, so that's fine. So from a USB connection point of view, that's all set up. But remember, what I also need to do is to be able to hear this instrument. So I need a audio routing, which is going to allow me to hear this sound as well. Well, that's easy. I've got my audio device set up, the Volt 276 interface, and I'm using inputs one and two. Remember, those are the physical connections that I've made between the synthesizer and my audio interface. So I've got a USB connection here, and I've got an audio receiving channel, which is going to monitor the sound actually coming out of the synth. So when I've done that, I can press create. And what's going to happen is I'm going to get a brand new track, which is just called instrument three. But here we have a chance to see the external instrument plugin. So because I tick the box to say, yep, I want that inserted, please, here are those choices that I've made all over again, which means that actually I could change them. So if I had a whole bunch of synthesizers that were plugged in and I suddenly decided that I didn't want to use this one, but instead I wanted to use something else, then I'd be in a position to swap it out here from a MIDI destination perspective. Again, there's all the same list of options that I had before. And similarly, if I had an, um, a, an audio interface which had a multitude of different audio inputs, and I had different synthesizers connected into different audio inputs, I'd be able to select those here as well. So this instrument allows me to configure those things. Now, just before we begin to see what we can actually use this for, let's just look at another way that we could actually set that up. So what I'm gonna do is to create another instrument. I'm gonna create a software instrument this time, and I'm gonna set up a completely empty channel strip. Now, what that means is that when I select create, nothing is assigned to this instrument, nothing at all. So if I wanted to do this from scratch, what I could do instead would be to come into the instrument list. I could come down to utility, and here I'm going to find that the external instrument option. What I can then do is to just literally make all of those options available here. So once again, I could come into the Hydrosynth Explorer. I could make sure that I'd set up my audio input on inputs one and two. And now effectively what I've got is the same system. So you can do it one of two ways. You can either do it directly from the launch page from a new track, or you can just do it one step at a time using the external um, uh, synth plugin, the external instrument plugin directly from inside the utility folder. So we don't need both of these options. I'm going to get rid of this track that I've just created and we'll come back to the one that we originally set up. So effectively what that means is that now I've got an external instrument track. And the way that I have an opportunity to check that this is working, well there are a number of ways I could do that. Firstly what I can do is to play this instrument. Okay, that's working. So I'm getting some sound directly from my keyboard. But what I also need to do is to just check that that's definitely the right track. In other words, you know, obviously I could be playing one of Logic's internal instruments, but I can see that I'm not because I've selected this particular track. But what we can also do is I can hear that I'm triggering notes directly. What happens if I record some? Well, let's just come over here where nothing else is happening. I'm just gonna press record and we'll see whether or not I get a sequence. Yep, so sure enough, I now know that my keyboard is working as a master keyboard input, and I know that it's playing sound because we can hear it playing back, and when I press play, we'll hear what I've recorded. Okay, so it's working. We've got this nice sort of setup now where effectively what we've done is we've made this instrument part of our mix. Okay, now the reason why I wanted to do that is because I actually want to double this little pattern sequence which is being played on this instrument down to my external instrument plugin. And rather usefully, what Logic is doing is saying, hang on a moment, you've got some automation on that track which doesn't in any way relate to the instrument you're about to assign it to. 
In other words, there are parameters that exist on that track, whether those are for logic effects plugins or whether they're little bits of spot automation that maybe exist within that dusty piano pattern, which aren't going to translate to anything on the Hydro synth. So do I want to retain that data? Do I want to delete it or do I want to pretend I didn't even get asked that question and press the cancel button? Well, I don't need it for the Hydra synth, so I'm going to just delete that data. It doesn't exist anymore. And you can kind of see that there's a lane of automation data along the bottom of this dusty piano pattern, which now has just been sort of switched off within the Hydra synth. So again, I can solo this. Let's listen to it. Okay, so there is that pattern now being triggered on the Hydra synth, and I can hear it in the context of the track overall. Okay, so that's working really nicely. Now, what's the only drawback of this system? I can't really see too many at the moment. I've now got my opportunity to work with my external synthesizer within my project. Yeah, but what if what I wanna do next is to use this project on my laptop when I'm out and about somewhere else? Does that mean I need to take this synthesizer with me and to permanently keep connected the audio um, sort of feed from it to my audio interface and so on and so forth. There's a lot of stuff now which needs to be in place for this sequence to play back in a way that it is at the moment. Physically, I need this keyboard connected. I need its leads. I need my audio interface. That's a lot of stuff. So if I like the sound of this, one thing that I might want to do would be to record this sequence so that it becomes an audio file. That means that I lose MIDI control of it. It means that if there's an individual chord within this sequence I don't like anymore, there's not a whole lot I can do about that apart from externally process it. But it definitely does mean that I can make a kind of print of this become part of my project. And that would be a good idea, I think. It also has the other advantage of the fact that what I can then do is to say, okay, I've now got this sound, and what I'm going to now do is to set up another external instrument to access a different sound. Maybe I want a pad from this instrument as well, and I can go through and use loads of sounds from the Hydra synth, one at a time, one after another. So to record this, what I need to do now is to turn it into audio. Now remember, at the moment we are what's called monitoring this sound through audio inputs one and two. The reason that we can hear it is because Logic has effectively created a situation where we're monitoring literally listening to the sound of this synth through audio one and two, but that doesn't mean that we've recorded it. To record it, we're going to need an audio track. So I'm gonna set up a new audio track here. I'm gonna make sure that the audio inputs are set to inputs one and two, and then what I can do is to press create. And what's gonna happen now is a new audio track is going to appear, and I'm gonna call this Hydrosynth, which feels like an appropriate name for it. And what that basically means is that if I put this track into record monitoring mode, I'm gonna have a chance to see the level coming in from the Hydra synth, and I'm gonna see what that looks like on the audio track. So the advantage of pressing play rather than record is it gives me an opportunity to set the recording level. Now then, I've said this on this channel before, but if you're new to audio recording, the temptation is to think, oh, you know what, actually there's only 2.7 decibels of headroom on this sound. So what I'm gonna do is to drop the level of the recording. That's not what that fader does. That is not what that fader does. What that does is to turn down the volume of the recorded sound, okay? So no amount of me turning the volume down with the volume fader is going to affect the level at which that sound is going to be recorded. That's what we refer to as gain. It's volume coming into logic, whereas that fader controls the volume of playback of audio. So I need to make adjustments somewhere else. A couple of places I could do that. I could turn down the master volume fader from the Hydra synth. So if the level coming out of the synth is too loud, I could adjust it there. 
The other place that I could adjust it would be at the gain stage on my audio interface. Now, every audio interface is going to give you a gain dial. Most audio interfaces will actually give you a physical dial, but sometimes you'll get a little control surface, which maybe runs as a little program on your computer, which allows you to adjust gain over um, a, a USB connection. But most of the time, you're actually going to have a physical dial on your audio interface. And again, if you turn those down, you're changing the input level into the computer. And that's going to be really important, particularly if you're using two separate channels and they both have a gain dial and they aren't matched. So we're going to press play again, and I'm going to see whether or not the left and the right signals are balanced from a volume perspective. And that in itself is quite confusing because it's a stereo sound and it's moving around a little bit in the stereo field. So at the beginning, it looked like the right channel was much louder than the left. Actually, they look pretty well matched. But if I did want to ever so slightly trim the right channel, I can reach for the right input of my audio interface and ever so slightly pull that down. But I've played it through a couple of times and the signal hasn't peaked. There's a decent level. So what I'm going to do is to record it. Now then, what's interesting is that the output channel has overloaded and it would be very easy to think, oh, OK, I've recorded this signal too loud. Now, there are actually two separate reasons, possibly three, that I can think of why that channel is suddenly overloaded. Remember, on recording it, we engage the click track and the click track, therefore, is contributing to the signal reaching the stereo output and therefore everything is louder. When I press play, the click track's not going to play back, which means that was only temporarily part of what was reaching the stereo output track. But also, and this is a really important point, remember what the external instrument plugin does is to create a kind of temporary audio monitoring solution for your sound. In other words, it's setting up audio tracks one and two to listen to the sound of the hydrosynth, which means that this track alone is making sound. And now what we've done is to set up another track to record that sound. So in other words, we've got playback of this sound happening here and we've got it happening here. So one thing you can do is to mute the audio input as you record that sound. That won't stop it from recording. All it will do is it will stop the sound of the recorded part reaching the stereo output. Does that make sense? Should do, I hope. OK, so what we've now got is a recorded version of this sound. And now I find myself in a temporarily really useful position. I've got the audio version of this sound here, and I've got the currently playing back version of it still happening. So if I press play now, both of those sounds will play back at once. And we don't need that. We only need one or the other. So I might decide now to mute the external instrument, which means that it's not going to make any noise. In other words, if I now play this sound by itself, it's not going to play any sound. And what we can do instead is to swap in the audio version just to check that that's at the right level and it's doing its thing. Sure enough. So what that now means is that I've obviously got the advantage of this being audio. I can chop it up. I can do interesting things with it. I can process it using Logic's effects, all those kinds of things. What it also means is that effectively now my hydrosynth is available to me to change patch, to go somewhere else and to now add a second sound. So if what you want to do is to work with external instruments within a Logic project, that's how you do it. Use the external instrument plugin, which you can either set up at the point of creating a new track or going and finding it in the utility folder, making sure that you've got your connections, both from a USB and from an audio perspective, into your audio interface right. And when you're happy with the part, there are obviously huge advantages to recording it as an audio file, because now I can save this project and I can take it with me wherever I go without having to take this with me.